So thank you again for coming on the Friday afternoon to the seminars. Today uh, is uh, as he will be talking about his research. He's a visiting professor from the Wayne State University and he's working with Marco. So thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. I will give a fair to give this talk because this audience is so different. <laughs> And so if it doesn't go very really well, you know, blame Giosca. <laughs> she essentially put me in a hostage-like situation and I won't take a no for an answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, if you have any question in between, just you know, feel free to stop me. So just to give a brief introduction, why it is not working again? Is it on? So I think we have the screen. Yeah, maybe it's okay. I think this is no, it is fine. It's not the same. Yeah, let's see. Okay, now no, 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 it's okay. Okay, okay. So <laughs> okay, so first I will tell uh, what I came from. So I'm from Detroit. Oops, sorry, this is not a pointer. <laughs> we saw all the slides already. <laughs> okay, so so here is the map of the United States, and you can see it is marked Detroit. Okay, so you're very much of the north of uh, US and actually the nearest city of Delta of Canada is south of us. Okay. Uh, this uh, Detroit is of course famous for uh, all auto companies, right? Uh, so big three. And here you can see Joe Biden with his wife. Uh, every year we have international uh, auto show. Okay. Uh, that is a worldwide event. We are very famous for uh, pizza. Okay, so we have our own style of deep dish, or deep crust pizza. And many times we want competition, national competitions between Chicago or New York. So if you go to Detroit, make sure you have this pizza. Uh, it is also very well known for uh, cultural side. Okay, it is, uh, there is a whole band of music called Motown and many of the famous artists, you can recognize some of them, they pass from there. So I came from uh, this university called Winston University, which is a couple of miles uh, north of Detroit downtown. So this is the fall color, okay? It is taken about two weeks ago. So now all the leaves are gone though. Uh, this is my, on the right hand side, you can see my department, okay? So we have about 30 faculty, okay? About 120 undergraduate student. As a whole university have 3000 faculty, and close to 30,000 students for this fall. Uh, I am an experimental soft matter physicist. Okay? Uh, so what is soft matter? Uh, all of you may agree that beak is not a soft matter. Okay? Uh, water is also not quite soft. Okay? What we tell soft matter is which has the properties that are intermediate between solids and liquids. So everyday examples of soft matter, you can think yourself when we are for spinning and the stuff of the liquids and the gels that we have to take out, okay, and put in a clear plastic bags, those are the examples of soft matter. Like it can be toothpaste, it can be lotion, it can be cream, like that. And these are called soft because they are literally soft, okay? So if a small amount of input of energy uh, can make a drastic change of their properties. So what we tell is that KBT scale energy, so KBT is associated with the thermal energy. Okay? KB is called the Boltzmann constant, and P is the absolute temperature. So many times actually I write these things in terms of equilibrium nanometer. Okay, that is easy to remember. This tells you the length scale and the force scale associated with these type of systems. So T is equal to about 300 K for soft matter bonds. So you can easily by changing the temperature. Okay, you can you can make uh, big changes of property, you know, compared to your know, coherent ones. 
There is also a lens scale associated with it. Okay, so typically for the tail, the soft metal lens scale is from one nanometer to 10 micrometer. Okay. And examples can include, for example, milk, which are the fat globules of the size of a few micrometer, a typical hydrus of the size of 100 nanometer, or the bacteria has a size of a micrometer. And there can be other examples you can draw from other fields like protein molecules, soot, cosmic dust, environment pollutants, they also fall in this lens scale. So now the question is that how objects of this size, one nanometer to 10 micrometer, move within a fluid. Okay, so this is a textbook question, and this question is for the graduate students here. Okay, so suppose you have a bacterium, which is it is taken from this textbook. Okay, a bacterium, it is a sphere of suppose radius one micrometer, propelling itself at one micrometer per second. Okay, at time is equal to zero, the bacteria suddenly stop swimming. Now, following Newton's law of motion, how far does it travel? Okay, which one of, of these is correct answer? What do you want? Other three. So you are not considering right at all? It is in a fluid. Okay. Rest assured, if you don't give the correct answer, you can still drink beer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me tell you. Yes, you are correct. Okay, yeah. So he get the first beer. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> the correct answer is the last one. Okay, so it will stop within a gate of an angstrom, which is even less than the size of a hydrogen atom. Okay, so when you put objects like this, this size there. Okay, once the push stops, it is going to stop immediately. Okay, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't move. So this is like one micrometer plastic balls in water, and these plastic balls are kind of flowing this zigzag move. Okay, so do you know what is called this motion? What is the name of this motion? It is it is the name of a famous botanist. Brownie. Okay. Okay. He's a snake. Okay. So this is for the Brownian motion. Okay. This is a random zigzag motion, and it is a manifestation of that the water molecules is colliding with these balls. Okay. And sometimes we have a large fluctuations of molecules, okay, colliding from one side to the other, and then you can have some application with this placement. Okay. So this is called the Brownian motion. So I have currently two projects, okay, how nanoparticles leads to polymer network and how colloids pack on top of card surface, okay. So I briefly talk about both of them, okay. And uh, so first I will start with the last, uh, the second one, that how colloids pack on the top of a card surface. So colloids are, if you do not know what is colloids, these are again the particles of suppose scales of a nanometer to 10 micrometer. Okay, they can be made of plastics or glass like that, and they exhibit the Brownian motion. Okay, so uh, now what is self assembly? Self assembly is that suppose you start with these you know, Lego blocks. Okay, and if you have a manual, you can build these mega structures. Okay, now obviously it's not self assembly because you have to do it, uh, uh, you have to follow all the proper rules here. Now, Separately or individually, these Lego blocks are not very interesting to study, right? But when you get these structures, okay, uh, you would like to see that. So this is actually very common in nature. One example is for it uh, is like cell membrane, right? It is the phospholipid molecules, they can naturally form this lipid bilayer. There are other examples for ex like gecko finite or the spider silk. They have the self assembled structure that gives them unique properties. Like, you know, for example, if they get a feet, they can stick almost to any surface. Okay. And the spider steel, which is very light and but very tough. So, our experimental system that we use is a liquid mixture, okay, which is in water, and the you know, chemical details are not important. Okay. We call the liquid. Now, this is a typical old system stuff. Okay. So uh, it has a lower critical solution temperature. What it means is that, so if you look at the temperature scale, 
Okay, it is about 35 degrees centigrade. So at the room temperature, it is actually homogeneous. Okay, it is a it is single phase. But when you cross this line, okay, and so you are raising the temperature, it can go into the two phase regime. Okay, so typically what we do is that we mix it up with heavy water to match the density of the polystyrene particle. So our system is that we have this two liquid mixture. I change the temperature. And we put some polystyrene particles, okay, which is just a plastic box, and they have a diameter of about one micrometer. Now, uh, uh, if you are not familiar with this type of coexistence curve, these days actually there are a lot of interest of you know equilibrium phase separation also in the context of biology. Okay, so you may know about the uh, coarser here. So these are the liquid droplets, they can be rich in the macromolecules and they can perform some very important functions. So this is important, for example, like membraneless organisms, and many times people speculate that life started to form, but they form this type of liquid, liquid phase separation. So in our situation, what happens is that, like when we go from the one phase to the two phase regime, okay, so liquid phase separating, then this micrometer, these plastic spheres, they can spontaneously assemble on this carb liquid liquid interface. Okay, so these are like these colloidal domes. And like you can look at the lens, you know, this is about say you can form the domes from 10 micrometer to 100 micrometer. Now the question is that what can you do then? So the question that we can ask is that how these colloidal particles then pack on the top of these spheres, okay, or part, part of the sphere. So this is actually an interesting problem. Like suppose all of you know how uh, marbles can pair most efficiently on a solid on a, on a flat surface. So if you think about a billiard game at the start of the match, and if you look at one of the billiard balls, each of them with six neighbors. Okay, so this is called six board coordinated particles. And you can so you can form a hexagon and you can fill up this whole of, of two-dimensional surface completely without any gap with these hexagons. But that is not possible on a sphere. Okay, so if you have the soccer ball, you can count the number of hexagons and the pentagons you have. You can have any number of hexagons, but there must be 12 pentagons. Okay, so this is originally solved by Euler. Okay. And this is called a topological charge. So the pentagons have a topological charge of plus one, heptagons have a topological charge of minus. These are called charges because uh, they have some similarity to the electrical charges. Okay? So the light charge is simple, unlike uh, charges attract. So a pentagon can always bind. So a five-fold coordinated particle can always bind with a seven-fold coordinated particle. Okay. And uh, so they attract. But light charges, they kind of repel each other. So now if you look at a single dome, okay, so this is how it looks like. Okay, this is a confocal uh, microscopy image of a single dome. And what we can do is that we can reversibly form and destroy these domes just by crossing the uh, phase boundary. So what we can do is that we can look at the how the defects form and how the defects evolve. Uh, around these domes. Okay, so you can see this is for the coronal tessellations and all these white hexagons that you can see, these are like all of them with six neighbors and all the blue and the red that you are going to see, these are like the pentagons and the hectagons. And in the solid-like phase, they form kind of these lines. Okay. But when you go to the liquid-like phase, okay, then what happens is that instead of, so you see, you can now see there are more blues and the reds, and you can see more like patches of the reds and blue, and they are separated by these, uh, these hexagons. So this shows more or less like liquid and the solid coexistence around the phase transition. So you can do like different types of analysis, like you can have like, for example, you can start with what we call the crystalline domes. Okay? So there is, you know, there is never a part of crystal here. You can calculate the structure factor. Okay, you can assume that these particles are bound in a harmonic potential and you can calculate the potential well. From the potential well, you can calculate what is the spin constant. From the spin constant, you can calculate what is the depth of the potential well. 
okay, and you can compare it with the theory, for example, okay, for by calculating the fair potential of the system. So uh, what we would like to see and do also the test some of the theories like in the two-dimensional theory of uh, it is for KTH and my theory and the first two of the persons got Nobel Prize few years ago. Okay, so you have like in the case of three dimension, there is a discontinuous transition from solid to liquid. Okay, when there is a phase transition or when there is a melting. In the case of 2D, you have a series of transition. First, you start with a single crystal, then you get an hexatic phase, and then you get your liquid phase. Okay, so there is the continuous transitions. So what we further going along we want to study is how these topological defects evolve on the curved surface. Okay, when it undergoes a melting. Now I try to make it. Uh, I made an effort to give you some examples of you know why it is also relevant to the biology. Okay, so for example, like you know, you know the many of the viruses. Okay, have these like small viruses. Many of the coatings always arrange at the vertices of this. Icosahedron. So icosahedron is the, you have the 12 sides, okay, and you have 12, uh, 12 corners. Okay, so icosahedron is one of these platonic solids, okay, so it is called the perfect solid and perfect shape. And so you have like 20, like you can think about on the top of the pile of the 12 corners, okay, there are like kind of the, what the putting seats. But typically, what happens is that. Uh, if you have a point defect like that, these are called disclinations, then it causes a lot of elastic stress. Okay. And then for larger viruses, and that increases with the size, surface area. Okay, so it goes as R square. Okay, R is the radius of the virus. So once it becomes very large virus, then you develop this type of facetted isolator. Okay, so it goes from a perfect sphere or close to a sphere. To this type of catheter shape just because of uh, this elastic strain that it causes. Okay, so some of the stuff that you work on these colloids on the carved surface has also some implications of understanding the biological morphology. Uh, so moving forward, actually, we're looking at trying to put these active particles onto the carved surface and see that how in that situation you have activity. Okay, changes the motility induced phase transition. And there are some recent simulation in this area that shows that how this, uh, how this effect or what is called the motility induced phase transition can affect uh, you know, various uh, biological phenomena. So to, this is also the paper that was uh, appeared as a cover page in the soft matter uh, some time ago. So for the last part, actually, the second part, okay, so I'll talk about for 10 minutes, okay, so uh, how the nanoparticles diffuse through polymer network. So I will talk only the cross-linked hydrogen, okay. So hydrogen, if you're familiar with JV, for example, okay, uh, it is 99% water. Uh, like diaper is another example of hydrogen, one pampered diaper can hold almost like a liter of the water. So microscopically, you can think about the gel is kind of like a long polymer molecules and they are connecting with these black dots. Okay. Now these black dots are bonds. This bond can be physical, like a hydrogen bond, for example. And the common uh, physical gels uh, examples include like agarose or EVA. Or that can be chemical bond. Okay. So then in the case of chemical bond, it is the, or the chemical gels, the bonds are essentially covalent. Many of the polyelectrolyte, okay, they form this type of covalent bond. So previously, like I talked about these colloidal particles, or I showed the movie, right? This Brownian motion. And you know what is the property of the Brownian motion? The mean displacement is equal to zero, but mean square displacement is proportional to time. Okay. And the proportionality constant is for the diffusion equation. It is almost like you can think about you put a drop of ink on water, and D decides or diffusion coefficient decides at what rate. Okay, the for the for the the, for the, point of, the point of the drop is going to spread. 
So uh, microscopically, actually, you can think about that this is a gel. Okay, so our system is that we have this gel network. So I replace the water of this part that we have originally the picture of the particles diffusing in the water. Now the particles is diffusing in this polymer network. Okay, and uh, so this is the red dot is these particles, and this is the polymer network, and the average distance between those two bonds. Okay, we call the mesh size. And it can be measured experimentally, okay, and by using the, the using the elastic modulus of this gel, you can find what is the mesh size. Okay, and this is a very simple relation. So, uh, what are the traditional theory that uh, that explains the diffusion of these things in a gel? Okay, this is a widely studied problem because, for example, the you know diffusion of water, say for example, through the sand. Okay, or through the filter, okay, or the membrane. Okay, so technologically it is very important. So for the small molecule diffusion like water or the oil through porous medium, okay, there is a Darcy's law. Okay, actually there is a unit called Darcy. Okay, that is usually the petrochemical industry that defines the permeability. Uh, then there is a screened hydrodynamic interaction which gives us some kind of a stretched exponential form. Okay, and then there is an obstruction diffusion model. So obstruction diffusion model is very simple to picture that, you know, a particle is trying to go from one place to another, but there is an obstruction, right, from the network. Okay. So, and as we increase the concentration of the polymer, then the diffusion will get slower and slower. Okay. Uh, but this model essentially works for the stiff polymer network. So here actually I have shown the, our data for three different sizes of the particles and we plot the diffusion coefficient as a function of volume fraction of the polymer. Now for the physical gel, uh, volume fraction determines the strength of the gel. So the elastic modulus will increase with the volume fraction because we have the more polymer and we have more bonding. Okay, So that means that as you go on the right hand side of the curve, modulus is increasing Four size is getting or the mesh size is getting smaller and smaller. Okay. And as you can see, for the larger particle, none of these things can work or uh, can work. Now, the interesting regime is actually that when the size of the particle is larger than the mesh size of the network. Okay. Then classically, all, all the theories predict the particles is not going to diffuse at all. Okay. Uh, but microscopically, what can happen, you can think about that to go from one case to the another, you have to cross a barrier. Okay. And, and this crossing this barrier is an activated process. Okay? It is, it is, uh, uh, it is, it is called the hoppy in this situation. So the particle can try to cross the barrier many, many times. Okay. And depending upon the thermal energy, and the ratio of these uh, and the strength of the barrier, it can eventually overcome. And what we found is that there are kind of like, uh, so if you do not have any hopping, these particles like the data that you show won't diffuse. Okay, they're going to get stuck. But due to this hopping motion, okay, these particles can go from one place to the another, and you can see a non-zero diffusion coefficient. And from the data, we can collect, okay, you know, what is the what is the barrier for the activation energy, and we can estimate it from few kBT to like 20 kBT. So these types of you know, like you know, to draw an analogy like this is also observed recently in the, the bacteria can hop and trap, okay, in these types of porous medium. So this is the uh, yeah, e. coli bacteria, okay, so what this paper has found that instead of this normal, you know, round and tumble motion that E. coli bacteria does, okay, essentially it can get trapped in this porous medium and then it can hop from one pole to the another, okay. Uh, so this might also be seen actually that we are now trying to design an experiment where we can use active particles, okay, and if in the case of like if we it gives some energy to the active particles, you can probably lower the activation barrier and the hopping will become more frequent. So my current research direction in this way is that I am working now with the mucus system. So obviously, you know, mucus is just pop, okay? It is a disgusting stuff. We do not want to talk while we are drinking beer, right? Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it is essentially, it is an end-time real heterogeneous, 
and a very sticky mess. Okay, so that is the picture that you have. But, but mucus is extremely important because it acts as a first line of defense okay, against any invading bacteria or the virus. And it is also responsible for many diseases like asthma, bronchitis, you know, cystic fibrosis, like that. So typically, like the mucus layer near our lungs looks like like looks like this. It has two layers. Okay, so one layer that is very close to the air, okay, that is a very highly viscous mucus gel. And the layer close to the lungs, actually, or the cell, okay, that is a low viscosity layer. And near the cell, you have the cilia, like the one that you also have in a lot of this microorganism. Okay, and the cilia creates this wave, okay, that clears this gel or this mucus every few seconds. Okay, that is what happens when you clear in our uh, mouth, for example. So currently we are working on developing a, like, so we do not work with the real mucus, okay, because that is the, you know, you are not doing work with the clinical studies, uh, but we want to work with the model systems, okay, because only they we can get reproducible results. So we are trying to develop a microfluidic based uh, mucus model to replicate some of the features of this, of this uh, uh, natural mucus. And calculating also after the first passage time for both passive and the active Brownian particles. So connecting to I, 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 uh, I, uh, your mission over here, as we mentioned that uh, I'm working with uh, uh, Professor Marco Polin and Oscar. Okay, and what I learned is that there is also something called phycosphere. Okay, so that is also something like very similar to these entangled, sticky. Okay, and this could last area. Okay, but this phycosphere plays a very important role, okay, for the phytoplanktons, for example, and it is important to know how the small molecules or virus or the particles, okay, are uh, diffused through this medium. So that is the purpose for me to come here and uh, learn from Marco. Okay, so I think that's it, right? It is 30 minutes talk. <laughs> Very <Managing> time. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. So have, have you done uh, stuff with uh, actual viruses? Uh, no, no. <laughs> we don't have those facilities. <laughs> but... <clears throat> oh. The uh, so how how does the surface charge of viruses, for example, would, it, would affect the uh, the motion through real nucleus? Yeah, so essentially, like many of the viruses actually, which passes through uh to the mucus, they are they have an equal amount of positive and negative charge. So they're overall elliptically neutral. Okay, but they have an equal amount of positive and negative charges distributed in such a way that they can pass through the mucus, okay, without getting stuck. Okay, so both positively charged particle and the negatively charged particle is going to get stuck in the mucus layer due to just the electrostatic effect. Okay, but you can make uh, neutral particles. Okay, uh, so but making the that type of mimicking that that type of virus is extremely difficult. That where you have an equal amount of positive and negative charge. Oh, sorry, making particles or particles of equal amount of positive and negative charges and distributed nicely so that you can get overall neutral particle. That is very difficult to do. Okay, synthesizing those particles. So what people do is actually they make uh, you know short brush of polyethylene glycol. Okay, on the top of this particle. So that creates a kind of like you know, entropic uh, repulsion, and these are called a stealth particle, which can go through the mucus without getting stuck. Okay, so many viruses use that type of flavor trick actually that, uh, to overcome the mucus barrier so that the charge effect is not, uh, uh, cannot just, uh, you know, act as a barrier. But, but is there, uh, do you think there has been a selective pressure to I don't know, specify the surface charges of the part of the proteins that um, face the outside? Then? And is that then affecting 
the in any way the cohesion of the capsid. And does that pressure have a detrimental effect, for example, on the cohesion of the capsid, do you think? Okay, so I think I, I'm not quite actually following it because I'm not familiar with this terminology very much. Okay, but, but what I'm telling is that uh, charge effect is so it is turned out to be both carboxylic modified polystyrene particle and amine modified polystyrene particle. So both positively charged and the negatively charged particle. Okay, they will get stuck in the nucleus. Okay, they will not get to. Okay. Uh, so this is the, the so this is the charge effect. Now the particles that can get to the mucus are those which are electrically neutral. Okay, but even that is not enough. So what you need is some kind of a grafting on the particle surface, okay, so that it can pass through this mesh. Okay, now how high does uh, like you know how they are distributed actually in like uh, so, uh, the positive charge and the negative charge on the proteins. Okay, that particular chemical details I'm not very much familiar with. Okay, how these charges are distributed on the shape. So that is the one we're talking about. And why you don't use real virus to do this kind of experiment? Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I am actually the, you know, it is in the physics department, okay, well, I am not trained in that area, okay, my training is very much in the, in the soft matter side, so I feel more comfortable to work with the particles, we can do some surface chemistry, okay, rather than working with the real stuff, okay. <laughs> With the, I guess your particles behave like the virus. So that, that is our purpose is actually to work to make particles also soft. Okay, so currently the work experiments that we are working, these are not soft particles, these are hard particles. Okay, so make it, our ultimate goal is to make the particles soft and patchy. Okay, but when you go to this length scale of 100 nanometers, say, Okay, making those things controllably and characterize them is almost impossible. Ultimately, you just measure something like a zeta potential. But that doesn't tell you that how the charges are distributed on the top. Okay, there is no other experimental technique actually that can characterize it on that length scale. Okay, so, uh, 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 so you know, mimicking that exact system is very difficult yeah, exactly. compared to working with a real system. <laughs> but real system, like I do not know, I, I I I don't think that we can work even like in the whole Michigan Michigan University of Michigan. We have some facilities actually, which has this NIH clearance, you know, biosafety labs, okay, to work on the viruses. But we do not have anything like that. <laughs> we even do not have a cell culture station or anything in our department. But I'm, I'm sure you could work with viruses that are not uh, pathogenic for humans, for example. Like right. marine viruses, some marine viruses, for example. So the marine viruses might be problematic because of seawater has uh, a lot of charges and stuff. So. Okay, yeah. No, and when you do one of these tests, mm -hmm. then you, you check that this also is happening in somehow in real life? I mean, is there any way to measure? Oh yeah, people have done this real life. Uh, you know, they, they have extracted mucus, you know, from patients. Okay, and uh, you have to be very careful. You have to develop. You have to get these protocols, right? You know, it's yeah. called IRB protocols you know, uh, to collect this mucus. But many times also they come with contamination. Like you know, they can mix with saliva, for example. Okay, so that can change the morphology, okay, and also the rheology of the mucus. Okay, and That's then too complex. <laughs> and that is too complex, and uh, in, in your mucus changes from person to person, your uh, health condition, okay, and like uh, uh, ultimately, like if you want to get reproducible results, then you have to, have to work with some kind of model system, even yeah. if it's if, if yeah. not realistic. <laughs> <laughs> but that is what as close uh, as you can get. Okay, so we can now make this mucus gel, for example. Like you can, so, main main constituent of the mucus is this protein called mucin. 
Okay, so it is a it is a glycoprotein. So it has the amino acid chain and it has it has a structure of almost like a bottle brush. Okay, so it has an amino acid uh, uh, chain and then you have brush like carbohydrate groups that gives it like you know sticky and a kind of shielding effect. Okay, uh, so. Uh, so the main thing is the mucin molecules, but if you just get these mucin molecules, you know, from chemistry, uh, from uh, chemical companies like Fisher, they do not form gels. There are a lot of impurities. Okay, so there is a way actually to make the gel by using thiol bond. Okay, so we use like polyethylene glycol thiol molecules to bind these things, uh, these mucin, so that it can form gel. Okay, so that is how like. And that comes actually very close. It has the elasticity very close to the normal mucus. Okay. It's okay. very interesting. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. We can continue our discussion with some viewers. Okay. <laughs>